fishing, uh, give some tips, tips, tricks, and techniques away, and uh, hopefully answer some questions for you guys and help you uh, hopefully put more fish in the box. So by way of introduction, guys, my name is Captain Dylan Hubbard from Hubbard's Marina. Hubbard's Marina is over there in Johns Pass, Madeira Beach. Uh, we're about a 45 minute drive west of here. Uh, so not a, not a bad trip over to John's Pass and Hubbard's Marina. We mostly uh, do nearshore and offshore fishing. Anything from uh, the beach essentially out to about a thousand foot of water. We specialize around 40 to about 250, 300 foot of water. Grouper, snapper, amberjack, pelagics, everything in between. Uh, but we also have private fishing charters that do a little bit of everything from um, mackerel, tarpon fishing on the beach, all the way out to uh, deep water, deep drop fishing in deep, deep water. Uh, plus, we work with uh, guys like Captain Mike Anderson from the Real Animals to do inshore fishing too. Uh, so it doesn't matter what type of fishing you want to do, uh, you can give us a shout and we'll get you set up with either us or one of our partners. So uh, today we're going to be mainly focused on that near shore and offshore fishing because that's what we specialize in. Uh, but I like to talk with you guys, not at you. So if you have a question, don't be afraid to raise your hand and uh, we'll get this thing started off first by talking about what's going on now and what's coming up and then we'll get into the questions, okay? So right now, uh, this time of year, we're coming up on that exciting time of year where those kingfish and mackerel start running. Uh, it's end of February going into March and as that water warms up, those mackerel start showing up, which they pretty much already have this week. It's super early, but we're already seeing those mackerel show up on the beach, which is exciting. We're seeing those big bait schools show up along the beaches. And then shortly thereafter is when those kingfish will show up. Typically, they follow kind of a lunar cyclical pattern. So we'll see the mackerel show up, and then if the weather kind of stays consistent and normal, uh, we'll see those kingfish show up on the next lunar cycle or the next full moon. Uh, however, uh, with the cold, cold weather we have coming in this week, that might kind of disturb things and slow things down a little bit. It is awfully early to be seeing the amount of mackerel that we're already seeing on the beaches, but that's exciting and a good sign of what's to come. Hopefully it will have a nice long mackerel and kingfish run. Uh, those mackerel and kingfish anywhere from your beach piers all the way out to 25, 35 miles, we see those mackerel and kingfish super thick. It's a lot of fun and it kind of makes bottom fishing a little bit more exciting this time of year. Also guys, we have those hogfish biting really well near shore. We see a great bite of hogfish right now and that should continue into later spring. Once that water starts warming up, that's when those hogfish will start slowing down a little bit on hook and line and make it a little bit tougher to catch them. But we do catch those hogfish all year round. Uh, also, we're looking forward to uh, triggerfish. Triggerfish opens March 1st, and those triggerfish are great eating fish. How many of you guys have tried a triggerfish? If you're not raising your hand saying you tried one, you're missing out. Trust me, they're very good eating fish. Uh, we typically find the bigger trigger fish out in deeper water on our 12 hour extreme or 39 or 44 hour trips. But you can sometimes run across a few on a 10 hour all day. But trigger fish season's around the corner and it's gonna be short. It's open March 1st and it will close May 2nd. So we don't have too much time to get out there and catch some of those great eating trigger fish. But we're looking forward to that. Also, we're coming up on that time of year where we see those big mangrove snapper in lots of them. Uh, gag grouper, red snappers right around the corner. Before anybody asks, we'll talk about red snapper real quick. Red snapper season for private recreational anglers. Those of you who have your own boat or you fish in your buddy's boat, private recreational anglers means anglers fishing on a private boat. If you have a fishing license with the state of Florida, that season begins June 11th 
and it's going to run through July 25th, about 45 days. Now, if you're fishing with a boat like one of ours at Hubbard's Marina, or another charter boat or party boat with federal permits, Red Snapper season will begin June 1st, and it's estimated to run about 68 to possibly even 70 days. So most likely, probably somewhere June 1st, till about August 8th or 9th is what they're estimating. But that season has not been finalized. We'll find out more about that here in the coming week or two. And once they finalize it, we'll announce it on our social media, through our videos, through our live shows that we do every Sunday night. We'll talk more about that. But the private recreational season, excuse me, that has been finalized June 11th through July 25th, okay? All right, what was your question? Yeah, that's it. June 11th through July, July 25th. I answered your question before you even asked it. I like it. I like it. <laughs> what was your question, bud? Um, my birthday's in March. Your birthday's in March? Happy early birthday, brother. <laughs> Any other questions? <laughs> so first of all, if we don't have any questions, we're going to get rolling and talk a little bit about uh, just general things. One thing that I always like to talk about is uh, bottom fishing, how important it is to have that natural presentation. And at any time, guys, if you want me to talk a little bit more about something that I mentioned or if you think of something, if you have a species you want to talk about, please don't hesitate to raise your hand. I'd rather talk with you, not at you. Okay, guys, so if you have a question, let me know. Uh, so, as I was mentioning, it's so important to present that bait naturally when you're near shore and offshore fishing. I think, in my opinion, what really separates an advanced angler from uh, an a intermediate angler or a little less experienced angler is that ability to present that bait naturally, to hold bottom, to make sure that bait doesn't spin, and then feel the bottom. So those four items are gonna ter take you from uh, not being super Hi, experienced offshore. Interested in becoming a Bass Pro Shop Club member? Apply to become a Bass Pro Shop Club member and upon approval of your Club Master Card, receive $20 in Club Points at Spadina Globes Day. Just for applying, you'll receive a free hat and a Cabela's Catch All bag. Please scan out for details or stop by the club booth, which is located at the front of the store. And as always, thank you for shopping with us and have a great day. All right, so like what I was saying is making sure that you're holding bottom, your bait's not spinning on the way to bottom, making sure you're feeling the bottom and presenting that bait naturally is so important. So one of the biggest things you want to make sure you do is whatever your type of bait you're hooking, whether it's a, a sardine plug, a live shrimp, live pinfish, you want to make sure that you're deliberate the way that you rig that bait to ensure that bait's not spinning on the way down to bottom. So one of the best ways to do that is making sure that your bait is hooked in a proper way to make sure that the skinny ends point down towards the lead. This morning, unfortunately, we couldn't get any dead bait to show you guys, but we do have videos on our website. I did pass out those little cards that are sitting on your tables. Those little cards have a link to our website. When you're on that website, you can click fishing trips, scroll down to fishing tips and tricks, and there's a video that shows you how to rig uh, your double snell rig, which is, <coughs> this is what we primarily use when we're offshore fishing with dead bait. Essentially what it is, is you're allowing two hooks uh, to be in one piece of bait. So wherever that fish bites, he's going to have a hook in his mouth. So the double snell rig is primarily what we use 95% of the time offshore when fishing with dead bait. So if you're fishing with live bait, most of the time you want that supernatural presentation, uh, super uh, tempting looking. So we're going to use a single hook rig when we're fishing live bait. When we're fishing dead bait, we have the ability to get both of those hooks hidden in that bait. So a double snow rig isn't going to take away from your natural presentation. And it allows an even greater chance of hooking that fish when he does eventually bite. So dead bait, double snow rig, live bait, single hook rig. 
uh, making sure that you're hooking that bait so it doesn't spin. So, for example, on live bait, most of the time, I'm gonna hook them right up underneath the chin and out the top of the face. You wanna make sure that you do it that way because I see sometimes people go down through the nose and out the bottom of the chin. Now you've got the hook hanging underneath the bottom of that chin and as that fish moves across the bottom, it's much easier to get snagged up. So always up underneath the chin, out the top of the face. When you're hooking that pin fish, that squirrel fish, that pig fish, whatever live bait you happen to be using. And making sure that it's going down the bottom quickly and it's not gonna spin is super important. If you hook it in other places, it does tend to spin. One of my favorite things uh, on uh, pinfish is up underneath the anal fin. So that back fin just below the anus is called the anal fin. Right above it, about maybe a quarter of an inch, uh, is a great place to stick a hook because when that fish is laying on the bottom, your lead drops down the bottom and it's sitting on the bottom. Now that we're using a single hook rig because we're using live bait, that hook's right below or right above the anal fin. It's actually weighting down the back of the fish. The weight of the hook, let's say my hand's my fish, right here my thumb is the anal fin. So my hook's right in that anal fin. And as that fish is trying to struggle away from the weight, the hook tends to kind of weight the back of the fish down. And that fish is struggling trying to get away from the weight and it's it's just doing the, the, the dinner bell dance, you know? Struggling around your weight, kind of uh, all that struggle and trying to pull that weight off the bottom really gets those fish excited. But when you hook it any other place besides right up underneath the chin and out of the face, what happens? When you go to bottom, that weight is dragging that, oh, tangled up already. All right, so as you go to bottom, that weight is dragging your bait to bottom. So if you hook it back behind or back above the anal fin, as that weight goes to bottom, that weight's dropping to bottom quickly. Your bait's actually up here getting dragged down to bottom because it has more drag than this heavy weight and it gets really close to your main line. Well, anywhere you hook it besides the either end, either bitter end of that bait, it's gonna tend to spin. So if that bait is spinning, you wanna make sure you slow the descent of your weight. So whenever you hook it up underneath the chin, out the top of the face, you can rocket it down to bottom, just like you were using dead bait. When you hook it above the anal fin, it's a super, super natural looking presentation. It's great when you're anchor fishing and the bite's a little bit slow, that's when I do that. But you gotta actually put more pressure on the spool with your thumb to make sure as it goes down to bottom, it's going down a little bit more slowly and that won't get all tangled up and you won't end up with a big tangled mess at the bottom. Because if you rock it down to bottom and your bait's spinning, your bait's gonna end up in a big tangled mess right up underneath the bottom of the boat. And no fish is gonna get anywhere near that big tangled mess sitting on the bottom. Now, when you drop down nice and slow, you hit the bottom and you stretch out your uh, your leader, what's gonna happen is you're gonna have a really, really natural looking presentation with your bait stretched out as far as it can be from that weight, and it's gonna look really, really natural while on bottom. Then you're gonna work really hard to hold the bottom to make sure that weight's not moving on the bottom. Now you're gonna have a really good looking presentation that that big, aggressive, but super smart mangrove snapper, red grouper, red snapper is gonna come up and wanna eat. If it's all tangled up in a big mess, or you're not holding bottom, that weight's moving up and down, no big, aggressive, smart, quality fish is gonna come up. You might still catch some of those porgies, some of those smaller mangroves, some of those more aggressive, really hungry fish might still come up and eat, but that big quality fish is gonna elude you. So making sure that you're hooking that bait properly so it doesn't spin, learning how to hold the bottom and feel the bottom, making sure that you're feeling that bait and making sure it's laid out naturally. And then when you feel that fish bite, start to crank to set that hook. Super important uh, thing. So what I do is when you get your bait all hooked up right, you're ready to rock and roll, you drop it down to bottom. So when you drop down to bottom, a lot of the times your weight is gonna drop right next to or even on top of your hooks. 
So when I drop down to bottom for the first time, what I do is get all situated, butt underneath my right arm, left hand out front, right hand on the reel. And if I, if I have any slack in the rod, I'll pick up that slack so I feel that weight, and then I'm gonna wait. Typically about 45 to 60 seconds, I'm waiting. If I don't get a bite in that first minute or so, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna lift up on my rod tip nice and slow, and then I'm gonna set it back down to bottom nice and slow. And what, what that does is I'm stretching out that leader. So if that weight falls to bottom and falls right on top of your bait or right next to your bait, when you lift it up real slowly to the sky and then drop it down real slowly, the current is actually gonna stretch out that leader and make it look even more natural. Because this, this looks a lot more natural and a lot more tempting to that big grouper instead of this, right? You don't wanna eat anything sitting next to a big old 10 pound weight. You want a nice clean looking plate, uh, nice presentation, if you will. That's the same idea for these fish. You gotta remember to think like a fish. And then also, you wanna make sure that you're holding bottom because that weight bouncing up and down on the bottom even if it's moving only a couple inches off the bottom, that's loud. And sound travels three times faster underwater than it does in the air here. So this is only bouncing about six inches off the ground and it's making that much noise. Imagine how it sounds on the bottom at the uh, gr ground of the Mex Gulf of Mexico. It's even louder, it's even more spooky to those fish. It's super important to make sure you hold bottom. Well, what you do is call Dancing with the boat. Can you put your arm out, palm flat for me, up like this? So I'm gonna put that weight right in your hand. Just hold that weight flat for me. So uh, you gotta dance with the boat. So move your arm up and down, just like your the boat would move. So as he's moving his arm up and down, I'm moving that rod tip with the boat. So as the boat moves in the way, come on, man, that's like one foot seas. Give me a challenge. So as the boat's moving up and down, no, you gotta keep your hand flat, because if I move the weight, it's gonna fall out of your hand. So as the boat moves up and down, I'm dancing with the boat. I'm keeping that line tight enough to feel the lead, but not tight enough to disturb the lead on the bottom. It's super important, thanks, man. It's super important to make sure that you're doing that and you're constantly actively fishing. Moving that rod tip with the boat and constantly keeping enough tension on the line to feel the lead, but not enough tension on the line to disturb the lead. Because even if the lead just rolls over or moves just a little bit on the bottom, the hard bottom that we fish for these grouper and snapper is covered with the silt layer. So even the slightest movement of that lead on the bottom creates a little puff of sand. That little puff of sand is only four, five, six feet from your bait. So that little puff of sand is enough to scare that nice big old grouper that was looking at your bait away from your bait. So it's super important to make sure that you bait up uh, so it doesn't spin. You hold that bottom and then make sure that that lead's not moving on the bottom. And then as soon as you feel the bite, start cranking and get that fish up to the surface. Does that all make sense? Yes. Do we have any questions yet? <laughs> Normal size of your weight, that's a great question. Typically, my weight size is gonna match my mainline size. So if I'm using 40 pound mainline, I would typically drop the zero and a good starting point is four ounces of weight. If I'm fishing 60 pound mainline, drop the zero about six ounces of lead. 80 pound mainline, drop the zero eight ounces of lead. That is a normal kind of go-to starting method. Now, if the current's running really strong, I might need a heavier weight. And if the current's not running at all, I might even drop it down a little bit in weight size to have a little bit more natural presentation. Uh, fishing deeper water, you gotta use a little heavier weight. But generally, fishing near shore and offshore, inside at 200 foot of water, that's a great rule of thumb to start with. Now, you wanna make sure always that you do this setup. In my opinion, this is the best kind of setup when bottom fishing. This is called what they call a fish finder rig. I just call it the right way. Uh, it's an egg sinker above on your main line. Then you have a swivel 
and you have about a four to six foot leader. Typically a longer leader when I'm drift fishing, a little shorter leader when I'm anchor fishing. Uh, but always want to make sure you have that egg sinker freely moving above your swivel. The idea is that egg sinker sitting on the bottom and even the slightest touch of your bait is going to make that line move through the lead. So even just two fingers just barely touching it, you can see my rod tip move. I'm only moving that line at maybe a uh, three quarters of an inch and my rod tip's already bouncing. Now, if I tied a swivel above this lead and I start pulling on this line, nothing's happening with my rod tip because that fish has to hit that lead hard enough to move that six ounces of lead off the bottom before my rod tip moves. You're not going to feel as many bites. You're going to miss more fish. You're going to lose a lot more bait. You're not going to catch as many fish. So having that slip lead is super important. It gives you a much better uh, sensitivity and you typically end up catching a lot more fish. That's what we're out there to do, right? Come on guys, wake up a little bit. Yes, sir. What about the hook size? Are the tandem hooks enough? Yeah. Great question. So as far as hook size goes, most of the time you kind of tailor it to what you're fishing. So generally anything inside a hundred foot of water, if I'm fishing for snapper species like mangrove snapper, lane snapper, that kind of thing, about a four aught hook is a good starting spot. Even a three aught hook, uh, double snailed with a chunk of little thread fin would be a great option. Now inside of a hundred feet, if I'm using a single hook rig for a grouper or something like that, probably around a six aught hook is what I'd start with. Now, offshore, past 100 foot of water, 120, 200 foot of water, typically around five to six off hook double snell for those snapper species. And then like a seven, eight, nine knot single hook rig uh, for those live bait species and trying to target those bigger grouper, amberjack stuff like that. Uh, so real important is making sure you have the right tool for the job. And that goes all the way from your weight to your leader to your hook. And also, most importantly, the reel that you have. For example, a lot of people ask me, well, I, I'm getting started offshore fishing. Uh, I want to get a rod and a reel. What should I purchase? Well, it really comes, a lot of factors come into play. What, what's your budget? How often do you fish? Do you want to buy a little bit of everything? Do you want to buy just one rod to do it all? It's kind of your option. But as an experienced angler who goes out fishing a lot, I'm going to come with a little bit of an arsenal, if you will. I'm going to come with two, three, four rods. That way I have a rod and reel designed and tailored and tackled up for each individual species that I'm targeting. So for example, on let's say a 10 hour trip, a 10 hour trip, uh, for those of you in your own boats, a uh, 10 hour trip fish is about 15 to 25 miles, about 60 to about 100 foot of water. So if I'm planning a trip with my buddy's boat or my own boat or on my party boat 10 hour trip, uh, in about 15 to 25 miles, I would typically bring uh, this setup. So I typically bring one conventional reel, conventional reel being one of these guys, one conventional reel with anywhere from about 25 to about 40 pounds of drag, uh, rigged up with probably around 40 to 60 uh, pound monofilament. And then I would also bring one of these guys, uh, a little bit heavier duty, stronger spinning reel, uh, around 4,000, 5,000, 6,000 series, probably 25, 30 pound grade, uh, and about a 30 to 40, 30 pound uh, fluorocarbon, uh, like 15, 20 foot piece of line attached to that braided line. And then on these guys, I like doing either uh, you can do a fish finder rig like you did with your conventional, but my favorite rig is just a knocker rig, which is simply the same rig I showed you with a slip lead and a leader, except for your slip lead goes right on your leader and there's no swivel involved. So that lead goes all the way up your line and it goes all the way to your hook. That's a knocker rig. Now a knocker rig is typically a lighter weight. So I start, with that, start out with about one ounces of lead and sometimes even lighter lead if I'm targeting those less aggressive species. But that would be kind of my go-to setup for fishing inside of 100 foot for snapper, uh, for grouper, for hogfish, 
those two rods, because I use the conventional when I'm targeting those grouper or mangroves, so the bite's really good, I'm gonna use that conventional, because I can get down quickly with that heavier lead, I can feel that bite, I can get that fish up quickly with that heavier setup. Now, if the bite's a little bit slow, or I'm targeting hogfish, or I wanna just have some fun, then I would be using that spinning rod setup for a little bit lighter, a uh, little bit lighter action. Now, in addition to these rods, if I wanted to troll, I might bring something a little different. Excuse me. I might bring something a little different, or if I wanted to flat line during uh, the months of March, April, May, when those kingfish are around, you always want to have a flat line out. So I bring an additional rod to maybe flat line with. But as far as bottom fishing, those two rods would work. Now, yes, sir. Why don't you use uh, braid under conventional? Good question. So uh, for bottom fishing, I prefer using monofilament. Monofilament works really, really well. And braided line came out. It was really, really cool. Everybody's using it. Inshore braided line is the truth. That's the answer. I mean, inshore fishing, you've got to use braided line. You get more casting distance, more sensitivity. You can work that jig more uh, naturally. Uh, you, you have a lot more control. Braided line makes a lot of sense inshore. Flats fishing, bridge fishing, that kind of stuff. Now, offshore, when we're bottom fishing, straight up and down for grouper and snapper, braided line is not the best option. Now, you can fish braided line. There's a few situations in which braided line is preferred. So we'll go over those real quick. If I'm trolling, I like braided line because I have more line capacity in my reel. If I hook a big fish and he takes off, I've got more line capacity to stop that fish and not lose him. Also, that braided line cuts through the water more, so it's gonna get my trolling lure even a little bit more deep. So braided line is good for trolling. If I'm vertical jigging, if I'm vertical jigging a night jig, diamond jig, slow pitch jig, I'm gonna use predominantly braided line because my jig needs that momentum. I need to be able to work that jig. So braided line doesn't have any stretch, so it works really well for vertical jigging. Now, if I'm hog fishing, if I'm mangrove snapper fishing, if I'm fishing for some of those fish that bite quickly and might bite kind of timidly, I'd also use braided line uh, because it gives me more sensitivity. But I never ever would fish on the bottom for grouper, snapper, or anything without using what's called the top shot. Because braided line doesn't have any stretch. So what happens is when you hook that mangrove snapper, these fish aren't done. What they do is once you get hooked, they start biting, try to break you off from the bottom. If they can't do that, they start shaking their head and they start digging real hard. And essentially, if you're using straight braided line to your swivel or even worse, to your hook, what happens is that fish is able to tear a hole on the side of his face where that hook was sitting. And as he struggles and as he shakes his head, that hook, that hole gets bigger and bigger. And then as he's coming up to the boat, what they do about halfway up, once they lose sight of the bottom, they start swimming up towards the boat. So when you're reeling in a mangrove, a lot of times it almost feels like they come off the hook. Because what they're doing is they're swimming up towards the boat. And what they're doing is they got their mouth open and they're shaking their head trying to spit your hook. So if you're using straight braided line to your swivel or to your hook, that hole gets bigger and bigger and bigger, and then once they start swimming up to the boat, they have a really easy opportunity to spit that hook. And the chances of you losing that fish, even once you got them hooked up off the bottom, the chances of you losing the fish just while you're retrieving them is exponentially higher if you're using braided line straight. Now, if you use a top shot, that decreases the chance of you losing that fish on the way up to the surface. So when braided line first came out, all excited, lined up all my rods, went fishing. Sure enough, I started losing all these fish halfway up to the boat. And that's what was happening. That hole would get created in the fish. And I eventually caught on, reeling in a few fish, flopping them on the deck, and there's this huge hole. And all I had to do was touch the hook, and the hook fell out. That's what kind of caught on. People started using top shots. So what a top shot is, is it's essentially uh, a leader before your leader. So with this rig, for example, you can see I've got a fluorocarbon leader. I've got monofilament above the hook. But then if I cast out here, 
bit past now, here you're gonna see braided line now. So I've got basically a leader. Uh, I think that knot should be right there somewhere. Uh, it's a little shorter than I would normally use it. So you can see that line to line knot down there. That line to line, look at that, I caught a, I caught a clothing rack. Uh, so that line to line knot is gonna be uh, down there and basically you're doing a line to line knot from your braid to monofilament or fluorocarbon. And then from there you go to the swivel. Thank you, ma'am. So that is basically, that top shot is basically a leader before the leader. So it gives you some monofilament or some fluorocarbon uh, above your swivel. And that's essentially like a shock absorber for your truck or for your car. It gives that fish a little bit of stretch. So as he's coming up to the surface and he's trying to shake that hook and fight you, it's not able to be able to spit your hook as easily. So a top shot is super important when you're fishing that braid. So to answer your question, braided line works well for trolling, for vertical jigging, and for those fish that you need a lot of sensitivity for. But you always want to use a top shot. Monofilament works best for bottom fishing, for grouper, amberjack. You would not, trust me, I've done it, you would not enjoy catching a big 40, 50, 60, 80 pound amberjack with straight braided line. It whoops your butt. Whereas if you're using monofilament, that stretch makes it a lot more comfortable for you, puts a lot less pressure on your knot, your swivel, your hook, a lot less chance that that hook's gonna break, that knot's gonna give, or that line's gonna separate, and the chance of you landing that fish becomes greater. Plus, with things like grouper or amberjack, you don't need to feel the bite that, that sensitively because an amberjack or grouper is gonna come up there and nail that bait. So the, the need for you to feel every little thing is less important. So when I'm fishing for big grouper or amberjack, I'm using a rod and reel like this. So I'm not really gonna feel the bite too well anyway, because I'm using a heavier tackle setup. And when the big grouper comes, you're gonna know about it. So monofilament works better for that reason, because of that stretch, to answer your question. What kind of, um, yes, sir. What kind of weight uh, line would you use for your top shot? Is it closer to your main line or your floor line? So, uh, good question. As far as what size line to use for your top shot, most of the time I'm going to kind of match that to my main line within a 10 pounds or so. If I'm using 40 pound main line, I'd use probably around a 30 to 50 pound uh, top shot or anywhere in between, or just match it. 40 pound leader or 40 pound main line, 40 pound top shot. Now, I always want to match my rods to my main line. A lot of people ask me, well, what size line should I put on this reel? Well, if your reel only has 20 pounds of drag, putting 70, 80, or putting 60, 80 pound line on it doesn't make a lot of sense. You kind of want to match your main line to your reel capacity. Most of the time, my rule of thumb is you want to uh, never go above double. So if your reel has 40 pounds of drag to it, 80 pound main line is pretty much as heavy as you would put on that reel. If it's got 50 pounds of drag, 100 pound main line is pretty much as heavy as you want to put on that reel. And then your top shot, if you keep it within 10 pounds of your main line, that's a good rule of thumb. And then your leader, you can go 20, 30, 40 pounds heavier if you want to or match that main line. Because if your leader is super heavy, what's gonna happen? If your leader is super heavy and you're fishing bottom, when you get broke off, where's it gonna break? It's gonna break above your swivel. When it breaks above your swivel, you lose the whole leader, you lose the hook, the swivel, the lead. It's a pain in the butt to re-rig. And if you're using a heavier top shot and a heavier leader and you get broke off, where's it gonna break? Typically up on your braid. Now you've got a real pickle when you're offshore. You gotta redo the whole top shot, your, your swivel, your lead, the leader, you're out for 10 minutes, even if you're fast. So I always like to match my top shot to my main line or have it even 10 pounds lighter. Because if I break off, I'd much rather break off down in my top shot or on my leader. It's gonna be a lot faster to re-rig down there. Uh, did you have a question? Yes, sir. On your on your uh, level line right here. Yeah, this one. Yeah, is is there? I've seen somebody use the ones with the leveler. Yeah. And they, they break. It seems like. Yeah. And a guy was fighting a big fish with a leveler, and it just. 
So for bottom fishing, yeah. for saltwater fishing, uh, basically any saltwater capacity, a level line is not my favorite option. In my opinion, I would never buy one. And a level line, for those of you who didn't see his finger moving, is essentially that little thing uh, that moves back and forth in, in the front of the reel. So that works really well. A lot of people use them in the Great Lakes for salmon troll, and I know it's popular in freshwater. Every bass fishing uh, casting reel has one of those level lines. For offshore fishing, for salt water, it's a terrible idea. Because what does salt water do? It corrodes, it, it locks up, it destroys. So that little level line thing slows down and it really becomes an issue because there's no closed system to those level lines. They always have open uh, gaps to their gear and that gear gets corroded or salted or even slowed down a little bit. Now all of a sudden there's a tension point on your main line. And I've seen it so often where someone hooks a really big fish and it's screaming drag or he's fighting it really hard. So often that line <laughs> will separate or break right at that level line. I've seen it multiple times. And you don't want to hook that big trophy fish and have it break right in, right in front of you. It's, it's real sad. So I always, if I get one of those reels, I'll unscrew it. We actually got a few of them uh, for our, our rental rods one time and all we did was take those out. But uh, in my opinion, just don't use them if you can for offshore fishing. Uh, try to abide, avoid more purchasing them. Most of them are for freshwater use only. So to answer your question, level line is not a good idea offshore. Yeah. And the main reason why is because the corrosion, but also it's that tension point. When you get a big fish and it starts screaming drag, you can look at the reel. The line's always like crooked. It'll be going to the level line and then going straight out of the reel. And as that level line goes back and forth, that line's always crooked. There's a tension spot. It can never keep up with that drag. So it's just not a good idea when, you, when you're fishing for big fish in salt water uh, that are gonna pull a lot of drag. Yeah, I don't need For bass fishing, it's a good idea. Yes, sir. I got a five pound bass and a three pound trout. Whoa, a five pound bass and a three pound trout? That's awesome. No, Did you? Found 12. Oh, crappie? 12. I can't hear you. Crappie. Yeah. Crappie, okay. Very nice, man. That's a big one. Did you have a question? Yeah. Yep. Your top shot? Yeah, your top shot length kind of depends on what you're fishing for again. Uh, but the general rule of thumb is about maybe one third to two thirds of your line in the water to be top shot. So I kind of tell people if you're an experienced angler who can kind of feel your bait, you, you're good at holding bottom, uh, you're more experienced, then you can shorten up that top shot to like a third. But if it's your first time fishing braid, if you don't fish in deep water a lot, use a longer top shot because when you get tangled up, that top shot not only does it help, but not only does it top shot ensure that you don't lose fish, helps you catch more fish. But one of the big examples of a benefit of using a top shot is when you're party boat fishing, because occasionally when a big fish is hooked or something happens, the current's running, occasionally you run into your neighbors. And when you've got a top shot, that ensures that you're not uh, tangling braided line with mono line. Because when you tangle braid and mono, all you can do is cut that braid. Even the best can't really save that braided line from that tangle. And if you can, and most of the time you end up pulling it apart so much, your braided line is weaker. So if braided line gets tangled up, the only thing you can do is cut it. So I like fishing a little longer top shot in situations where the current's running strong, or I know there's a few people around me who might tangle me up, I might use a little longer top shot. And because I'm actively fishing and always keeping tension on that line and moving my rod tip with the boat, if I do happen to feel the tension of another line touching mine, all I do is start cranking as fast as I can. The idea here being if I feel tension of another line, I want to make sure I retrieve as much of my line as I can to hopefully ensure that if a tangle does occur, they're tangling up with my top shot instead of my braid.
So that's kind of my method to the madness. But as far as vertical jigging, I'm using a super small top shot, like six, eight, ten feet. If for uh, mangrove snapper, for hog fishing, I'm using a little shorter top shot, like 15, 20 feet. Now for just normal use, about one third to two thirds of your line in the water should be top shot. So if you're fishing 100 foot, about 30 to 60 foot. Yes, sir. That is a personal preference. So his question was on your braid, do you braid it all the way to that spool or do you add some backing? So most of the time for my reels, I'm doing it all the way to the spool because sometimes I fish in super deep water, 400, 500, 600 foot of water. And I need a lot of braid in that spool to reach bottom, but it costs a crazy amount of money for braided lines. So it's super expensive. So a lot of times, if you're not gonna fish that super deep water with your reel, it makes no sense to fill that spool up with braid. Add some backing to it, save yourself some money because you're not filling that spool as much with braid. It's much cheaper to spool your reel. Now, if you're gonna use it for bottom fishing in deep water, if you're gonna uh, flat line with it, if you're gonna troll with it, having more braided line is a good idea. So that's why you, there might be a situation in which you fill it all the way to the spool. So that's kind of personal preference. Once you get past 300, 400, 500 yards, anything above and beyond that is just if you're doing it for a special situation. If you're dead, if you look like a waffle or something, you can do it. Oh yeah. But if I'm flatline fishing and that wahoo does swim by, that whole reel is filled up with braid. So even if it's a really big fish taking off, I'm gonna have an opportunity to land it. Whereas if I only had a little bit of braid and a lot of backing, you start running out of line on that reel a lot faster. But I've fished 600 foot of water with this reel and I had plenty of line to reach the bottom because that braided line went all the way to the spool. With backing on it, you don't have enough line capacity to do that. So it kind of depends on your personal preference and what you're using that reel for. But most cases, most situations, add some backing, save yourself some money. Did you have a question back there, sir? Yep. 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 Is there really a So. Knocker rig, to review, a knocker rig is that egg sinker that goes all the way to your hook. There's no swivel, there's no leader. Uh, whereas the typical fish finder rig is this rig where you've got a sinker and uh, you've got a weight or a swivel and you've got about a four to six foot leader. Now, nine out of 10 times, I'm gonna be using this method. This is my preferred method. This gives me a super natural presentation on the bottom and it works really well. So most of the time I'm using this method. And typically, yeah, you can use a fish finder rig. Yeah, most of the time. Uh, but if I'm using a lighter tackle setup, if, for example, if the fishing's slow, or if the bite's tough, or I'm trying to target something like a hog fish that's a little less aggressive, I'm gonna use lighter tackle. So when I'm doing that kind of thing, I'm specializing it for a specific species. So most of the time I'd use the spinning reel and then I'd use a lighter tackle and a knocker rig. The, the idea behind a knocker rig is you're fishing before you hit the bottom. So as that lead or as that bait goes down, that lead gets further and further from your hook. So as it gets further and further from your hook, your bait is descending slower and slower. So as that bait gets closer to the bottom, it's falling super slow. So a lot of times, the idea with knocker rig fishing is you're catching that big aggressive fish before that bait even touches the bottom. You're fishing even above the bottom. So a knocker rig is specific for that reason. When the bite's slow, if you're fishing for that non-aggressive fish, or you're trying to catch that really big fish at the top of the water column. That's when I would utilize a knocker rig. Now, if I'm using light tackle, 20, 30, 40 pound test, 
I would still opt for a fish finder rig on a conventional reel, because I'm always gonna prefer a conventional reel. If the bite's good and the fish are chewing, I'm always gonna use a little heavier combo, a little heavier line, a little heavier leg, and the idea is this is gonna get me to bottom really quick. When the fish bites and I hook the fish, this reel is gonna get that fish into the boat as quick as I can. Because the idea is production. When the fish are biting, the fish are chewing, they're coming up, I wanna catch them quickly, I wanna get down quickly, I wanna put them in the fish box quickly and go back after another one. Now, if the fish are biting really well and I decide to go with this method, this takes a long time to get to the bottom. Even when I hook a small fish, it takes a long time to get them back up into the boat. So I'm catching less fish uh, in, a, in the same amount of time with that lighter setup. So that's kind of my answer to that question is I would use that lighter tackle and that knocker rig when the biter's slow or when I'm targeting something unique like hogfish or mangrove snapper. For example, on, on a recent 39 hour fishing trip, I went out fishing for fun. We start fishing uh, around midnight and by 5 a.m., 6 a.m., I was completely limited out on all the snapper. The bite was just incredible. They were just biting every time I hit the bottom. It was a ton of fun. So now I'm completely limited out, and what do I do now? So that's when I grabbed the spinning rod and reel. Bite was still hot, but I went to a lighter tackle setup, lighter weight, started dropping down big baits, and just had a lot of fun playing with those larger fish. And then that's, that's a situation where you kind of change things up. So it's kind of personal preference, depending on what you're targeting, what the bites do. Is there a difference in whether you dead bait, cut bait, versus using live bait? Typically, for a knocker rig, I'm almost always using dead bait. The only time I would use a live bait on a knocker rig is if I know that I've been fishing a spot for a while, so like on a 39-hour trip, sometimes we fish some of those peaks for five, six hours because those fish are just so prolific, they continue to bite. And that's a situation where I might throw down a knocker rig with a, live, a tail hooked live pinfish right above the anal fin because as that pinfish is going to bottom, one of those huge 10, 12 pound mangrove snapper that's come off the bottom will take it or one of those big blackfin tuna will take it. But that's a very specialty situation. Nine out of 10 times, it's dead bait, typically a, a double snell thread fin chunk going down the bottom on a double, on a uh, knock rig. Good questions. Yes, sir. Just a statement about the uh, gray line all the way to the reel. Yep. I was out fishing with a buddy of mine. I always use a back and he never does. Yeah. It started raining. And when you got a big fish, the line would just spin because it couldn't grab the reel. So that's why I always use a back. Yeah, yeah, backing, even if it's just a little bit of backing, it's a yeah. good idea. Just to make sure that that, that line grips the real spool. Uh, but if you get it spooled at a place like Bass Pro where they have the machine, that twisting of your whole spool is a lot less common. But you're right, a backing will make sure that line is seated down better. Any other questions? Yes, sir. excited about the new engine on the flying them too. Yes sir. Knot preferences? Uh, good question. So uh, my favorite knot preference, uh, for example, uh, for tying on uh, a hook uh, to my line, for tying on a swivel, any type of terminal tackle connection, 
My favorite uh, knot is what I call a knot, uh, a nail knot. Uh, now, I was just recently told that this is not actually a nail knot. It's just what I call a nail knot. Uh, back on our 39 hour trips, in the 70s and the 80s, uh, whenever you're more than nine miles from shore, it's legal to gamble. When my grandfather was alive, uh, he used to put a lot of people on those 39 hour trips. So nowadays, the boat's licensed for 110. We, all, uh, we have 78 rod holders. We only allow up to 50 to keep the quality of the trip high. When my grandfather was around, he put 100, 110 people on those trips. And 50 to 60 of those guys or gals were not even fishing. They were just going out there to gamble. So one of the things that they used to gamble on a lot was they'd have this knot tying contest. And every month they'd have the strongest knots come together and do this knot contest. Well, they ended up stopping the knot contest once this knot was kind of developed because it won all the time. And that's the knot that's kind of been passed down, and that's the one we use today. So I call it a nail knot. I don't know what the actual name is, but I'll show you real quick. And again, as I mentioned before, on our website, the video's there for these two knots that we're gonna talk about. So you can always go to hubbardsmarina.com, click fishing trips, and then click fishing tips and tricks for that video. But a nail knot is real simple. So with a nail knot, you don't have to have uh, any end of the line free. If this end of the line is already tied to a swivel, wouldn't matter. You can still tie a nail knot. So uh, hopefully you guys can see this, but basically front or back of the hook, doesn't matter which way you thread the line. The trick to the nail knot for me, since I've got fat fingers, is a lot of uh, tag line. So I pull out a lot of tag line. Your main line, I'm gonna pull straight out of the front of my thumb. So my main line's coming straight out of the thumb and then I'm pinching right where that main line and that tag line are meeting my swivel or my hook. Essentially just pinching right there and ensuring that main line is coming out of the front of my hook. Then all I do is reach underneath that main line, reach underneath that main line, grab my tag, tag line and then move that tag line underneath the main line around my thumb one time, two times, three times. So three loops around my thumb and the main line. Once you've accomplished that, then you just reach back, pull those loops off your thumb. The tag line is in front of those three loops. So all you do is put it behind those three loops and push it all the way through. And now you've got three loops around your main line and your tag line. And all you do is cinch those three loops down tight. Any type of cinch knot, you always wanna put some lubrication on with your, uh, dip it in a salt water bucket or getting some spit on there because whenever you're doing a cinch knot, if you do that without getting it wet, it's gonna deform your line and create a little kink. You never want kinks in your line. But this knot is as strong as it comes. There's nothing stronger than that nail knot. So whenever I'm tying a swivel, when I'm tying a single hook rig, whatever type of terminal tackle, it's always one of those nail knots. Now, the only other knot I would tie would be that double snail rig. That double snail rig is even easier. It's super simple. Now, you really can't see that from here, though. So me doing that snail knot up here isn't going to help you at all. So. Uh, but that video is on our website and after the seminar is done, if you want me to show it to you, I'd be more than happy to show it to you. All right, good question, brother. But nine out of 10 times, nail knot, nail knot, nail knot, or whatever you call it. <laughs> yes, sir. Are you gonna talk at all about using artificials for bottom fishing or? Uh, artificials for bottom fishing is not something I do a lot myself. Uh, it is becoming more and more popular. Um, uh, especially the slow pitch jigging thing. Uh, slow pitch jigging has become super popular, but that is really a specialty style tackle. You actually have to have, you actually have to have a specialty rod that matches the weight of the jig you're using. You have to have a special reel and the whole method to it is actually you're using the reel to work the jig for you. So you gotta have one of those accurate Valiant 500 ends and then have a rod that matches the weight of your jig. So an actual slow pitch jig fisherman who does it 
uh, for a living or who only uses slow pitch jigs, they'll come out with six, eight, ten rods and six, eight, ten of those accurate Valiant 500 ends for each rod. And then they come out with a whole bag like this filled with rolls of different jig sizes and jig types. Those slow pitch jigs are like $30, $40 a piece and they don't come with hooks. You gotta buy the hooks separately, they're $30, $40. The rods are three, $400 a piece, the reels $500 a piece. So it just gets super expensive for vertical jigging. So vertical jigging, uh, or excuse me, for slow pitch jigging, all that was in reference to this new slow pitch jig. Uh, it's a lot of fun, I've tried it a few times. Some of our crew, especially Anthony Belmonte, uh, Cap Anthony Belmonte runs our 12 hour extreme trip on the Flying Hub 2, and Rich Golis, a now Captain Rich Golis, uh, who runs the Flying Hub 2 as a mate, they both are super into the slow pitch jigging. So they got some of the jigging rods, they got a bunch of the jigs, and they do a lot of jigging on that 12 hour extreme trip. Outside of those guys, that's really pretty much the only two have kind of invested into that slow pitch jigging thing. I've done it with some of their tackle and it's a lot of fun. They're really unique. But most of the time when I'm vertical jigging or using artificial jigs uh, for bottom fishing, most of the time what I'm using is just something like a knife jig or a diamond jig. These are the vertical jigs that I use and these are not the slow pitch jigs, so I don't need anything special. I can just cut this swivel and uh, leader off and I can use this rod and reel for one of those knife jigs or diamond jigs or flutter jigs and uh, it works well. So that type of jig fishing, I do a lot. Vertical jiggings with vertical jigging with those diamond jigs or knife jigs are more for those aggressive, quick moving species like kingfish, tuna, amberjack. Sometimes you can get some uh, red snapper on them. The red snapper actually bite pretty good on them. And then uh, certain types of jigs like the diamond jigs, especially the smaller hammer giant diamond jigs, they work well for scant grouper near the bottom in deeper water. Um, but outside of that, that's when you get into the slow pitch jigging. The slow pitch jigs, they work for a little bit of everything. We have some clients that come out with us who will charter the boat to make sure there's no bait on the boat. We literally leave the dock without bait. It's trippy, it's weird. Uh, but we leave the dock without bait. All they do the whole trip is vertical jig with those slow pitch jigs and they catch a ton of fish like some of the better trips with bait. So it definitely works. It's just not something I've really invested a lot of time and energy and money into because it is newer. It's kind of taken the fishing world by storm. Does it work? Definitely. Is it a lot of fun? Definitely. It is expensive though. In a situation when you're on a party boat though, where there are bait in the water, then the art that, that jigging isn't... Now that's a good question. As far as his question was, when people are using dead bait, does the vertical jigging still a good idea? Does it work? Yeah, a lot of times uh, when I'm out there fishing, uh, that knife jig, that diamond jig, that flutter jig, if you're the first one out and the first one down, a lot of times you're gonna get that big aggressive fish first. So when you first get anchored up on a spot and get set up on a party boat, if you cast out a diamond jig or vertical jig, rocket it to bottom, work it a few times, a lot of times you're gonna catch a real nice quality aggressive fish. Also towards the end of a spot, once everybody's been fishing dead bait the whole time, they've seen nothing but dead bait, maybe a live pinfish or two, at the end of a spot, you cast out that big jig and let it work on the bottom a few times. Sometimes you'll get that big aggressive grouper. So at the very beginning and the very end of a spot is best for those vertical jigs uh, as far as on a party boat setting when most people are using dead bait or live bait. You know, sometimes you know how it is. Sometimes if you have something just a little different, that's what makes the difference between those fish. So uh, yeah, it does, it does definitely work, but I'm not the expert. I think there's a seminar actually coming up. I, I actually wanted to do attend myself. Uh, it, Benny Ortiz, he's kind of like the expert when it comes to slow pitch jigging. And I think he's coming to Southeastern Fishing Tackle Liquidators here soon. Uh, he's out of like Southeast Florida. And Benny Ortiz like pretty much pioneered the slow pitch jigging uh, over the last two to five years. So when he comes to speak, that'd be pretty cool if you want to, if you're interested.
Bring, bring your checkbook. Uh, I don't know if he's coming here. Honestly, I think they had to pay him to come out here because he's big time. He's, he's, he's becoming bigger and bigger with Pioneer in that sport. I know that they flew him out to Japan to do some seminars over there. So uh, I don't know how it all works, but I'm interested to learn more. Solid question over here. What kind of leader do you use on a jig? Yeah, typically with a jig, you want, uh, again, we're talking about diamond jigs, vertical jigs. Uh, I, we're using braided line and a majority of your reel with a short, like six to eight foot piece of floral carpet. The leader is just to make sure there's not braid straight to your jig because when you're working that jig, if you have braid straight to it, a lot of times it'll get tangled up in your braid. So a little piece of floral carbon is always a good idea. You don't need like a top shot though when you're fishing that jig. If you're using monofilament, it'll work straight to the jig, but most of the time, most jig fishermen, especially slow pitch guys, are gonna fish braid. Because that braided line is important because it doesn't have the stretch. So when, a, when you're jig fishing, like if I'm diamond jigging, the idea is I drop down to the bottom once I feel that jig hit the bottom. I'm lifting that rod tip all the way to the sky and dropping it back down. And that's what I'm doing. I'm working that water column. But if I'm using monofilament, even if I rock, raise my rod all the way up 10 feet in the air and lift it all or let it drop all the way back down, I might only be working that jig like six feet because of that stretch. Whereas if you're using braided line, you're gonna have less stretch. That jig's gonna move a lot more when you move your rod tip. So the biggest difference between slow pitch jigging and vertical jigging with diamond jigs, flutter jigs, night jigs is uh, the way most people do it with those more common jigs is you're moving your rods in. Those slow pitch guys are actually jigging with the reel. That's why it's only that accurate valiant end that works. All right, so um, yes, the biggest secret with vertical jigging is it's called vertical jigging. So the idea is you must be vertical. So the reason that that slow pitch guy comes out with this whole big bag of those different rolls is it's all different weights to those jigs. Because if you're not vertical, you're not gonna be working that jig right. It's not gonna have the right movement. So let's pretend my rod is my fishing line. If I cast out or that current's running and my line's like this, that jig isn't gonna work right. You need to have your line straight up and down or as straight up and down as possible to get the right motion on that jig to make it look more realistic and to get that fish to chew better. So vertical is possible. So the idea is you have a bunch of different sizes and weights to your jig because the current's running more, that weight's getting away from you, that jig's getting away from you, you gotta use a heavier jig. So most of the time what I tell people is if you're not a professional jig fisherman, you're not gonna jig fish the whole trip, maybe get one jig that's a little heavier, so that way you know it's gonna be vertical. Whereas if you wanna jig fish the whole time, come with a variety of jigs, so you're prepared for any current situations. Good question though. Got time for one more. Uh, I got a quick question. Yeah. Um, when you're on a party boat, you know, and you got 30 people that you're fishing with and stuff, is it, proper etiquette or does it matter because i always want to bring a flat line pole but you know usually i want to bottom fish while that flat yeah. line is out and you know good so. question so he's talking about using a flat line while you're bottom fishing essentially on party boats the general rule of thumb is you can fish with one rod so if you're bottom fishing that's what you do and you're bottom fishing now on our boat at hubbard's marina how it works with us is if the current allows, the weather allows, and it's not causing problems, you're more than welcome to put out a flat line and fish with that flat line with that rod up on the surface. Generally, I would, I would always encourage you, if I'm not on the boat, talk to the crew members and talk to the captain and say, hey, I want to put out a flat line. Is the current running right? What are the conditions doing? If the, everything aligns, the stars, moon, and sun align, and the conditions are right, you can typically put out a flat line. But if the current's coming at you and you set out that flat line and that bait goes underneath your feet and it gets tangled up with someone, you, you can't flat line. So it kind of depends on the situation. But yes, nine out of 10 times, you can flat line 
uh, while you're bottom fishing. As long as it's not a super busy trip, like during red snapper season, don't bother with it. Uh, but as long as it's not a super busy trip and the current and the wind allows you, what more than welcome to put out a ball. Good question. All right, so we're gonna wrap this thing up here, guys. Now keep in mind, y'all, uh, on the chairs, I passed out that little uh, pamphlet thing. It's got our website on it. On our website, we've got all those helpful tools we talked about, like the fishing tips and tricks page. We've got the weather links page on there too, uh, to show you what the weather's doing so you can monitor the weather for your upcoming trip. That little coupon, or that little booklet thing is also a coupon. It gives you 10% off a five hour half day or 10 hour all day, so hold on to that little book. Uh, we are gonna raffle off those three trips. For those of you who were here when we started, you got that raffle ticket, you could win a free trip. Uh, and don't forget guys, every Sunday night as well, we do a live stream show. So if you enjoyed the seminar, you can check out that live show. You can watch it from anywhere, anywhere that has internet connection. You can pull it up on your phone, your TV, your computer. It's live on our Facebook and our YouTube channel. Just simply search Hubbard's Marina and you can join us. We also give away free trips during that show as well. So if you don't win a free trip today, you can join us tomorrow night. You might win one then or any Sunday night at 8.30 p.m. Hubbard's Marina, we have a Facebook page. We have YouTube, we have Instagram, and we have Snapchat. Make sure you follow us on all that. And then also we have more brochures up here. If you guys wanna grab a brochure, it has our phone number on it. You can also text us at that phone number as well. So if you don't wanna call us, or if you have a quick question, whatever it is, you can always shoot us a text. And those texts go to me too. So you, you have a fishing question, you think of on the ride home, shoot me a text. Our phone number's right on the brochure. Okay, guys? Um, I think I covered just about everything, so we're gonna give away a free trip here.